Hello, I'm Michelle Malik, and you're watching In This Special. Today, on the 30th of July, the UN and other international organizations are observing World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. Now, the UN reported earlier this year that human trafficking was on the rise. Another startling fact was that children make up a large number of those, of those falling victim to trafficking. And as countless humanitarian crises erupt across the world, more and more people become vulnerable to exploitation. On today's show, we explore how widespread this crime is and how can communities help the victims. Joining us for this discussion today is Ms. Valeria Jota, who's an international relations expert. She's joining us from Ankara. Also joining us is Mr. Richard Thickpenny, the deputy CEO of Ashley Community Housing, an organization which helps with the resettlement and integration of refugees. He's joining us from Bristol. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Uh, Valeria, let me begin with you. Now, for the viewers at home and for myself as well, please explain what human trafficking exactly is and what happens to the victims afterwards. Well, uh, according to UN UM and the Palermo Protocol, human trafficking is strictly related to recruitment and transportation or transfer of vulnerable people from critical areas and, of course, the spoiling of those people by criminals, actually, that by human traffickers. Uh, it's mainly a problem connected to some critical areas where there are some uh, informal economies or there are some uh, warfare situations. Uh, overall, the, it's a matter of international, uh, international law, but it became a matter, uh, along this refugee flu, it became a matter of national uh, interest as well. Overall, any state has the obligation under international law to uh, obligation and responsibility to protect human rights. Therefore, the international law shapes the state responses in dealing with you, these, uh, those human traffic issues. Uh, the UN agency, UN and UN agencies have even the responsibility to monitoring activities on the, on the human traffic, human traffickers right. as well. Right. And the main problem. Uh, sorry yes. to interrupt here, but monitoring the uh, uh, the uh, uh, crisis and monitoring the crime rate when it comes to human trafficking, how widespread is this across the world? Well, actually, we don't. We, there, there is a sort of uh, difficulty in addressing the magnitude of human trafficking nowadays. But it's certain that the, the major crimes are coming from critical uh, critical contexts. So that nowadays they can be rogue states, sailing states or warfare space as well. There are certain estimations identifying victims coming from 80 different countries nowadays, but it's very difficult to assess all those numbers together. Uh, even because, as I said before, the, 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 the collecting data in such a context where there are failing institutions or rock states is not a, a, an easy task. Therefore, we need a more coordination, diplomatic coordination worldwide, and more monitoring activities along uh, these uh, international law and international organizations as well. Right, right. Uh, uh, Richard, I'm going to jump uh, what uh, Valeria just talked about here. And she said that there is difficulty in determining exactly how widespread this is because of the fact that it's not being reported enough. But now when the UN states that figure uh, states figures that human trafficking is on the rise, is it because it's just being reported more often? Or do you think there's actually uh, uh, actually the numbers are rising? I think the numbers have the potential to rise. It is difficult to know the figures, but with the refugee surge into Europe in 2016, it actually created quite a significant business. And that's where what the, the gangs have been making their money from. So Europe, Europe has, has paid to Turkey to close that border. And that the amount of money it's paid is probably equivalent to how much the traffickers were we're earning by, by by using that route. Similarly, Europe is now funding people in in Libya to hold back refugees from from Europe. So again, there's there's a large amount of money is being spent to right. stop the trafficking. So it's 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 been turned into quite a big business. I think that's that's a major issue nowadays. 
Right. And you mentioned how Europe is uh, placing more stringent policies on migration. Of course, it wants a pushback on all the refugees entering uh, 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 its borders. Do you think that's exacerbating uh, the problem here? The migration policies are actually causing for a rise in this. It certainly puts a potential because, because Europe is such a destination. Um, people are wanting to get there. And if you're an intermediary, if you're that trafficker, then you hold the keys to that crossing you know, from the, you know, across the Mediterranean through Europe. So you, you set the, the rates, the terms and conditions of travel, everything, which means you're in a position to truly exploit. Right. And then you've got the flip side in which when you get to the destination countries of um, modern day slavery and we're seeing quite an upsurge in modern day slavery as well. So those that are trafficked aren't being trafficked through to nice destinations. They're actually being tra trafficked and then exploited across Europe. Right. Uh, uh, Valeria, uh, we're talking how uh, nations with migration policies uh, as stringent as Europe's right now are maybe uh, intersecting with this crisis, this trafficking crisis here. Now, but when we're talking about all of this, do you see it this way as well? Do you think these countries are complicit in any way in allowing people to be put in this vulnerable position to be exploited in the first place? Well, as I told uh, before, in, in a critical situation, in critical countries, uh, when there are some uh, gangs uh, that they are aiming to, to get profit out of the misfortune of the people, of course, the human traffic is the uh, easy outcome. Uh, coming back to Europe, or according to this uh, immigration flu, um, it's easy that among the immigrants there are some human traffickers and it's not easy to monitor or the movement of those people. Um, Europe was busy. I mean, it was uh, improved. It's, a, it's, a, it's a system in signing several protocols and in signing several agreements, such as the agreement between the European Union and Turkey, in order to contain the risk of immigrants and in order to contain the risk of uh, human traffickers as well. Of course, at domestic level, we need an implementation of more border control policies and a, a better law enforcement in controlling the borders that are very often extremely porous of uh, getting those uh, victims towards uh, our border and towards our country. Right, well. but with these border control policies, it could very much well be that people who actually uh, do are in dire need of asylum, uh, who are desperate for refuge, they get uh, mixed with those people who are criminals. Isn't that true? Yes, it's true. I mean, actually what the sovereign state needs to do you now is just improve the identification and then the care of the victim then in order to protect them as better as they can. And uh, overall, in, in Europe nowadays, there is a risk, which is the uh, center-right uh, government are arising extremely, such as the case of Italy, for example. Italy nowadays is applying a sort of law not allowing any NGO ship uh, carrying immigrants to, to, to land those immigrants uh, to Italy as well in order to prevent immigration and that the Prime Minister says in order to prevent the human traffickers as well. Uh, overall, we need a coordination of policies among states and among the agencies acting within the state and among uh, states and uh, sort of other agencies such as the NGOs, for example, carrying those, uh, those immigrants. Right. Uh, it's not clear whether NGOs are sometimes they are just um, supporting so, so to some extent the activity of human traffickers who are just, or they are just uh, doing their job in, for, the, for the right of, uh, of the people to get uh, a better life, a better condition to rescue the victims for human traffickers as well. There is such a confusion nowadays. And this is one of the main reasons why the center-right government are arising as well in Europe. Europe overall. Right. Um, 
And Valeria, hold on to that thought. I do want to talk uh, about legislation and how that needs to be strengthened when we talk about human trafficking and how to uh, and how to take a, a, a take a grasp of the situation. But before that, I want to uh, talk more about the people who are vulnerable, the uh, children, how this process happens, how do traffickers get a hold of these people? We have talked about uh, refugees, but also other vulnerable segments of society. If you could enlighten us about that. Well, overall, the, the, the human traffickers are targeting vulnerable people as well, such as women, and they're trying to sell those women or to just make them slaves. Um, we are really, they are related to children as well. They, 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 um, eventually, they come to, to some other countries and they don't have a clear identity. Sometimes there are some doubts overall about their age, their, uh, the, where they come from, for example. Uh, right. That's why I think any stage, anyway, they have to raise awareness of that, and we need a, a diplomatic, a better diplomatic engagement on this. Right. The numbers are high. The, the emergency is very high. And actually, it's touching all, around, all of us. We need a comprehensive international approach because actually dealing with human traffic issues means that we have to entangle several subjects. So just human traffic as, as such, critical areas, for example, war, refugees, area, refugees right. issues. And Valeria, well, uh, over here, sorry to interrupt, but we have been talking about the countries might be very vulnerable in this, those that are facing conflict, those uh, that are developing nations. But we also know that uh, the world right now, as the uh, International Labor Organization claims, there is, are about 40 million uh, modern day slaves. And many of them also exist in parts of Europe, especially in the UK. Uh, Richard, when we're talking about this, modern day slavery being one of the reasons why people are hum uh, why there is so much trafficking, just tell us the extent of the situation. I haven't got figures, figures to hand, but anywhere you go throughout the UK, there's, um, there's car washes which are charging five pound for complete um, valets of cars and there's, there's been a high incidence of, of modern day slavery within those. In the agricultural sector there's also been quite a lot of exposure, N nail salons and a whole range, a range of industries are, are using these modern day slaves, e even the illegal drug industry in the UK. Right, so it seems it, like from the a picture you're painting it's quite widespread. Yeah, and any any sort of trade where cash is is the main currency, um, there's an opportunity to, to exploit. So we find if we have individuals who, so that they come to us as vulnerable and homeless, um, so they're already at, at risk of of abuse. If they get in with certain businesses who are willing to pay them cash in hand and there's an incentive for people to, to get as much money as possible because actually having to pay back their families for the, 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 tra the traffic and fees. If they go into cash in hand work then they're, they're immediately at risk of, of exploitation right. and ourselves right. we've been involved with, with rescuing Right. And Richard, one question that uh, comes to uh, uh, the minds of many, many people is that in countries and as uh, you were talking about the state in the UK, now there's so much government surveillance, there's such stringent regulations. How are these victims uh, gone unnoticed? How are they invisible? And how can society work towards identifying those that are victims of human trafficking? I think what happened is it hadn't. It, it wasn't spotted. We just we saw like the sudden rise of, of hand car washers and and, and other uh, nail technicians, and thought, "Oh, this is a, a new service." And it's only after a number of years, where it's, where legislation has actually caught up, where inspectors have gone in and found the first places that actually the legislation came in for the modern day slavery, and then there's concerted efforts by local authority. So it was something that was allowed to establish accidentally and and now it's retrospectively is is being controlled. Right.
And do you see the legislation being uh, being strong enough? Uh, do you think that there are uh, strong st strides being made in that regard in order to counter this? The, the, the modern day slavery act has, has come in and, and it has given police and local authorities powers which they didn't have previously. And the publicity campaigns are now in place around it. So I'd, I'd see a decrease over, over the coming years. Right. But, but Right. And on that note, thank you so much, Mr. Richard Thickpenny, for joining talking to us. Valeria, going back to you and talking about all these victims of human trafficking and when it comes to legislation, do you think legislation allows for them to have a second chance at life? And we're talking internationally here, uh, countries all across the world. Uh, what, con what is their stance? Do you think they allow them to have a second chance or do they criminalize them? Well, I think, as I mentioned before, we need, we need more coordination between among the international law and the national law. I mean, there are sort of differences between countries nowadays. There are countries such as UK who is performing very well according to containing human traffickers and taking care of the victims. And there are some other countries that they are not that well prepared. So what I think that we need a better understanding, first of all, at international level, a more diplomatic engagement and coordination for a more comprehensive international approach. Of course, we decide and that... And on what front do you feel that the consensus is not strong enough? For example, there are countries such as the Mediterranean, European Mediterranean countries that they are not so ready. Uh, at bureaucratic level, and they are not even so ready in facing those emergency, immigrant emergency nowadays, such as some other countries. Maybe because they are the first offshore, the first landing point of the immigrant flow of human traffickers, maybe because, like, such a huge number of immigrants, human traffic, traffickers are increasing dramatically nowadays, but I think they are not ready. Otherwise, we cannot explain even this, uh, is a, this a rise of a center uh, right or ex sometimes extreme right groups, right? It's a sort of process towards the, the, the current trend of policies and the global, at the global level, actually. Um, therefore, I think that we need a, a better approach, a better coordination, but besides that, we need to collect uh, better evidence. To, have, to, to collect better data in order to target the, the, the more sensitive countries where those human traffickers are coming from and where those, those, those few people are coming, actually. Uh, after all, we, we, we need to improve the identification and to take a better care of the victim in order to prevent again to to increase those numbers in order to erase awareness of what's going on and in order to apply sustainable right. policy right and uh, you're saying better awareness here and valria this is the question i put to richard earlier as well uh, how can there be better identification of victims and uh, w when we're talking about conflict areas uh, refugees i mean many of them flee their homes without paperwork they don't have proper documentation in this sense how do you find mechanisms to tackle this issue? Well, for example, trying to monitor and uh, apply a sort of registration criteria in order to recognize or to have a better idea of those people, age of those people, where those people are coming from, and the aim of those people. Trying to understand uh, if they are coming with some um, money with them, what is, what is the next target, if the country where they are landing is just the final destination or they are intending to go anywhere else. Uh, and try to support as they as any country can. I mean, on the daily basis, those, those, those victims, in order to protect them, in order to prevent them to to get affected by some other gangs eventually. Right. And on that note, thank you so much, Miss Valerie Nota, for joining us and talking to us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to be talking about what is happening in Syria in terms of the children as the casualties rise with more and more uh, air raids on Idlib. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Indus Special. Now, the UN reports that in the past 10 days, more than 100 Syrian civilians have been killed, with 26 children being amongst the victims. It was reported that in 2018, a record number of more than 1,100 children were killed in Syria. And these are just the numbers that can be verified. On today's episode, we discuss the life for children in Syria and what the future looks like for them. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Pierce Robinson, Director of the Organization for Propaganda Studies and Convener of Working Group on Syria, Propaganda and Media. He's joining us from Berlin. Maram Susli, activist joining us from Perth. And Mr. Fadul Abdul Ghani, Chairman of the Syrian Network for Human, uh, Human Rights, joining us from Istanbul. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Fadul Abdul Ghani, I'd like with you now when we're talking about the civilian casualties in Syria and specifically the children being uh, killed is this number unprecedented of course uh, in Syria is unpre unprecedented uh, comparing to the total figure of the casualties we are talking about like uh, between 20 to 25 from total civilians uh, who have been killed are children. And this figure is, is very, very much higher, even if there is like regular war. The percentage like between uh, uh, children and women should be, not be exceed maybe 3%, like 4%. In, in Syria, we are talking about, as I mentioned, uh, we, we have been following the uh, and, and focusing on the uh, abuses against children and mainly the extrajudicial killing that killing caused due to the shielding, and there is killing caused due the, to the torture, but mainly because of the shielding, shielding against like neighborhood, uh, uh, civilians' neighborhood, shielding against hospitals, even schools. There is a lot of cases and massacres taking place in Syria against children inside their schools or uh, inside their universities as, as well. So you would say so, that children are specifically being targeted? Not specifically, actually, but this is a random, random shilling. It's, kill, it's killed everyone. So, uh, and sometimes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amount to be uh, like punished for everyone. For example, when the, when the Syrian regime makes siege against Ruta, this siege affected the infant till like the age of 100. Uh, so, so it affected everyone. This is ma mass vi vi violation, actually. And this is similar happened when the shielding, so for example, when the barrel, when the regime throwing barrel bombs, this indiscriminate shielding. Sometimes they are, they use rockets against schools or hospitals or neighborhoods. This is deliberate shielding. So this is when it's uh, this uh, barrel bombs throw uh, against hospitals. Inside this hospital, children, women, civilians. So it's killed everyone. So the civilians have been targeted, but there is there is actually. Uh, deliberated uh, violation against children when the regime arrested children. They, uh, the regime treated them similar to the adult, actually, and tortured them uh, as well, and keep denying that they, uh, they don't have children. But when the photo is coming out from the regime media itself, it's showing that there is children among the civilians. And what could civilians. the purpose and of that be? When you are taking children in uh, custody and making no differentiation between a child and an adult, Actually, there is there is a main uh, aim for the regime, and we noticed uh, this tactic and strategy to punish all the society. If uh, if the regime like punish uh, my child, the, the, I will be suffered, and the other also will be terrified. So terrifying uh, the, the society, and also uh, in order to make any type of preventation to make this revolution or uprising against him again. This is the regime aim actually in doing this mass types of violation, including including using throwing barrel bombs, uh, uh, using chemical weapons against everyone. When the regime used chemical ones, uh, weapons in Ghouta, this killed among of the civilians, children. So this is actually mass violation. When the regime uh, also tortured and, and killed children due torture, we, we documented 100 uh, 157 children killed inside the, the center detention of the regime since the beginning of uprising. And uh, Mr. Fadul Abdul Ghani, you're reporting the numbers here. How difficult is it to verify these numbers? No, this this figure is the, the verified one. This is not estimation. We have database and we share this database with the UN, with the High Commissioner, with the Commission of Inquiry for Syria, 
So this is actually not uh, estimation. The estimation figure is higher than this. When we said that the regime, for example, is killed 22,488, uh, 22, 4, uh, for example, the Russian forces killed 1,875, the extremist group is killed about 1,000, uh, and between ISIS and right. al-Nusra. The armed opposition is killed 900. Th th the PYD is killed uh, 100, 190. Those are not actually uh, estimation. Those are reflecting our database, which is cumulatively, we are documenting cumulatively through our team since eight years till now. Right. And uh, 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 going back to the number you stated, before I, I let you go, I do uh, just want to ask a little more about this number. The 157 children you said were in custody. What happens with them then? Uh, the, when the regime, regime is arrest anyone, he keep them in very uh, tight places, actually. For example, a cell uh, three meter by, by, by four meter put uh, about between 40 to, to 50 persons. So uh, then uh, uh, there is no ill, there is no treatment, there is no cure treatment. If someone has disease uh, or ill, there is no uh, t treatment at all. So the, the, mainly, the main cause of dying in the center detention actually is torture, but torture caused of the disease actually. So they keep him suffer till death. There is no cure. There is no treatment at all in the center detention. And when some ask for this treatment, send him to the military hospitals, they, they treat him worse than the security branches. So he wished to be back, actually. So uh, then the other, when they, they, uh, the newcomer uh, arrested also again, the, the, their, their fellow uh, colleague pre uh, prevent him to... Uh, ask well, if he, he get disease, prevent him to ask for, right. to go to the hospital because he, uh, they know very well what will happen to him. Right. This is a tactic, actually. Right. And on that note, thank you so much, Mr. Fadulani, for joining us from Istanbul. Uh, Dr. Pierce Robinson, uh, let me move on to you. Now, you heard the figures that Mr. Uh, Fadul was giving out to us in terms of how many children are being targeted. And from what I gathered, he does, in fact, state when they're being arrested, being put into custody, and the fact that schools are being targeted, hospitals are being targeted, children who are not players in the war are, in fact, being precisely targeted. Do you agree with that as well? Well, it's very important, important to remember that in all wars and all conflicts, civilians uh, get caught up in these conflicts. Uh, it's extremely important that uh, all sides and all combatants should uh, adhere to international law and expectations on not targeting civilians. That's, that's a given, and that's what should be happening. But we know in wartime that Casual, civilian casualties occur. Uh, allied operations in Raqqa and Mosul in, involve large numbers of civilians being caught up in the conflict. Um, and there's no reason to imagine that wouldn't be happening here as well. Of course, it's both sides. I mean, part of the rationale for the Syrian government operation at the moment is to move into the de-escalation zone uh, because the de-escalation hasn't been adhered to by the groups, the opposition groups within that, and they have continued to target um, a population. So uh, the accusation of targeting civilians can readily be leveled at uh, the other side, as it were, at the opposition groups. So I, I think, you know, you need to keep those issues in mind. Right, but when I we're, think, uh, uh, Dr. Pierce Robinson, sorry to interrupt her, but as you mentioned here that in any conflict there are casualties. And of course that is something that everyone knows when there is a conflict, it's very difficult to uh, know who the target is and there are uh, 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 there is damage there. But when uh, there are uh, attacks on 142 schools, schools, civilian infrastructure for children specifically. Doesn't that go to show that these aren't just casualties? There was actually a specific target there? Well, this is the, this is the thing that, that you cannot establish straight off. We know that the conflict in Syria for seven or eight years now has been dominated by extensive propaganda 
and, for example, opposition groups promoting particular narratives regarding chemical weapons, making particular allegations regarding civilians being targeted. Now, as far as all of the evidence that I have looked at is that it's simply not clear that the opposition allegations are actually correct. In the long term, after this conflict is over, I'd like to see a proper inquiry into the activities of all sides and people held to account. But at the moment, it's simply unclear, and, and we have to be extremely cautious about, cautious about claims which are being advanced. More importantly than that, you need to, as with any conflict, think about what is exactly, exactly going on here in terms of the broader picture. We know that in Idlib, we know that ISIS and al-Qaeda-linked groups dominate. We know that that is Syrian territory. We know that the Turkish government is supporting and funding those groups actively as we speak. And so in that sense, I mean, any government or any state would be seeking to regain control of areas in this situation. These are parts of Syria and they are dominated by right. al-Qaeda and ISIS-linked groups. All right. And they are being by foreign foreign governments. So right. the fact that there's a conflict there is not a surprise. And I think it's that broader context which really needs to be engaged with if we're going to bring an end to the suffering of all of the people in Syria, in Idlib, and also in government right. areas. Dr. Uh, Pierce Robinson, uh, I do want to bring uh, Maram Sosli uh, into this conversation as well. Thank you for waiting patiently, uh, there, Maram. Now, uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Robinson pointed out here, that there are many factors that you need to take into account when you're talking about civilian casualties and the children, uh, the children being killed, and the figures that are coming out are murky. Do you agree with that as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a case a case of selective humanity. You have these so-called hu uh, human rights organizations that don't really seem to care about children because uh, they're focusing the, the plight of children, using it as a weapon against one side of the war. I mean, in one of your images of the children uh, that are injured being carried into the uh, ambulance is Omran Daknish. This child that you're seeing now in your camera, he's actually part of a pro-Assad family, and his image has been uh, exploited by the rebels, one of which was linked to the beheading of a 12-year-old boy. Now, this uh, the beheading of a 12-year-old Palestinian boy in Aleppo by the person who was taking this photograph of this child that is actually a pro-Assad child that found himself uh, under a rebel-controlled area, and hence, you know, they exploited and injured his family for their propaganda. Um, nobody really talks about the fact that it wasn't indiscriminate. These people beheaded the child uh, on purpose. And I'm talking about the insurgency that the Syrian military is fighting. But the, unfortunately, you know, the uh, media is trying to make it all one-sided. They're trying to say uh, that the government has uh, is intending to injure its own civilians, which is not going to be beneficial for the Syrian right, government right. because so, it's going to... All right, Maram, I, I've noted down your point there. But do you think when we're talking about all of this, and we're talking specifically about children here, and the reason for that is there's no way to politicize a child a death. You are saying that that's being done in this conflict, but do you think that children are still suffering in Syria in this regard? And do you think that there are casualties who are children, innocent children? Absolutely. I mean, they beheaded the 12 year old boy that was an innocent child that was beheaded. Um, and I see that it is being politicized because otherwise he would be one of the children that you show in your images. But nobody talks about that because it's not convenient for the narrative. And the narrative is that the Syrian government is brutal and they're just killing their people for no reason without the uh, understanding that Al Qaeda is in control of Idlib. They are brutalizing people inside Idlib and outside Idlib, but does, they are but shelling would that, Idlib, but, uh, but would that justify targeting civilian infrastructure in which you know that women and children are being housed? That's the claim, but there's no evidence behind that claim because the insurgents themselves are taking over civilian structures like schools and garrisoning them. And in fact, they've also been on record by the United Nations using children as child soldiers. I mean, these people don't care about children. They're using children as human shields. They're putting them in harm's way and they're taking over civilian structures like schools and using them for military purposes.
Right. Uh, 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 Dr. Robinson, now both and Maram seem to agree on the point that the evidence is uh, uh, not exactly there. But our guest before pointed out that his organization has worked towards actually finding a verified information when it comes to how the regime is treating children. Now, with all of these conflicting reports, whose narrative should people believe when they want to see the true picture? Or is there no way to make sure of what's happening? No, there is a way for people, people to work out in their own mind what is happening, to use their own judgment. But that requires people to think critically about the sources of information they're using and also to think for themselves about the conflict as a whole. Now, for any objective, independent observer coming in to look at the Syrian conflict, it, it is undisputed now that the Western governments and its allies have been supporting extremist al-Qaeda, ISIS-linked groups uh, for many years now. No, nobody disputes that. So if you start to understand what's causing the conflict, what is driving the conflict, you start to get a better understanding of who you might trust and who you might not trust. Now, anybody who comes in and suggests that this conflict is a straightforward, simple tale of an evil government against the population, that's a wildly inaccurate assessment, and it's a naive one. And people can think for themselves, and they can think, well, what's really going on in terms of the bigger picture? Who are the primary aggressors in this conflict? And, and you know, so I have to say this apologetically because I'm a British citizen. It is certainly the case that the British government, along with the US and the French, have been fueling the conflict in Syria extensively for many years ago. That's a major war crime, okay? That's an intervention against a sovereign state, and it's a major war crime which is not authorized. And I think when you start to understand the broader context of this conflict, it starts to put you in a better position to understand, for example, well, there are going to be civilians being killed on both sides. Um, perhaps there is deliberate targeting. Many of those civilians will be killed um, as, a, as, a, as a byproduct of the conflict, etc. Um, but I think understanding the broader picture, which I think the media have been very bad at communicating this, particularly the extent to which foreign actors have been trying to overthrow the Syrian government, that understanding that is a path through to understanding the complexities of the conflict and the reality of what has been going on. Right. It is possible to do that, but it means looking a little bit beyond a lot of the mainstream media narrative, which, as Mimi has pointed out, has been promoted so aggressively for many years now. Right. Dr. Robinson, I hear what you're saying there, but, uh, that people do need to look at the picture critically, but we can't deny the civilian casualties. Of course, everything that you've mentioned, the complex situation, how different factors need to be kept in mind. But the fact that we can't just turn away from the fact that there is a crisis there. Which organizations, if any, do you think should be held responsible for the humanitarian crisis uh, that is occurring there and for the protection of citizens or for at least providing relief, providing medical supplies, providing food? Well, okay, in terms of a conflict, okay, to, the people to hold responsible or the people to look to to try and bring an end to a conflict are the actors who are fueling the conflict, okay? And at the moment, at this point in time, in terms of the Idlib territory, we have the Syrian government trying to regain control over its territory, and we have armed groups who are being supported by Turkey and other states, etc. And if we want to look to responsibility, the responsibility for bringing this war to an end so that the suffering can end, the responsibility lies with the primary aggressors. And the primary aggressors are the opposition groups and also their allies externally, including France, Britain and America. Those are the countries responsible for driving and fueling the conflict. That needs to be brought to an end. The sanctions need to be lifted. And then there can be a conversation about reform and changes within the Syrian government, etc. But all the but, meanwhile, there will be more and more people killed. So until we, until everyone comes to the table, which doesn't seem to be happening in the near future, uh, what should people do? What people should do in the West, for example, is they should pressure their governments, as is happening increasingly in the US, to pressure their governments to stop supporting the overthrow of governments. This has been going on right. for almost 20 years now. That is that is the thing. If we want to end suffering, we need to end the drivers of the conflicts. And at okay. the moment, this is 
Right, I'm Dr. Uh, Robertson, hold on to that thought. Maram, uh, now, as Dr. Robertson, you um, uh, you must have heard everything that, you're, uh, that he's been saying, that the primary aggressors, they need to stop what's happening, and then you can look at the human picture uh, that is occurring within the area. Now, when we're going back and talking about the children, almost one-third of them, as is being reported, now... Uh, we don't know any way to verify that, but they seem to be out of school. Isn't it true that even if you do solve the conflict, you're creating further instability in the future when you're losing out on that generation? Absolutely. And I think I think that was part of the reason for the war on Syria and for the length of the war on Syria. The United States and its allies, Israel, uh, France, the UK, they want to prolong the wars in Syria for as long as possible so that there is a lost generation. I mean, the United States and its allies were responsible for uh, basically leveling Raqqa and Mosul. And at the same time, they were responsible for the rise of ISIS in Syria. So they've created the conflict and then destroyed Syria in the process. Um, they armed the insurgency. They gave them tower missiles tanks, they armed especially Al-Qaeda uh, uh, militants, believing that they, this is the way to overthrow the Syrian government. They don't really care how many countries they destroy. Um, they, as they said, you know, they want to destroy seven countries in five years. They, This cannot be seen outside of the picture of Iraq, Libya, and uh, every other country that the U U.S. has basically demolished in its uh, uh, drive for hegemony. Right. And it's only when we stand up to that drive can we end the suffering, not just of Syrian civilians, but of civilians all around the Middle East that have suffered these American wars. Right, but there seems to be a complete disregard for UN conventions. There seems to be a complete disregard on all sides for human rights here, as we have reiterated again and again, as and as Dr. Robinson said, until the main aggressors aren't told to stop, uh, the suffering won't end. Do you see uh, any progress on that front? No, because the UN is completely impotent. I mean, if there was any strength for the UN to stop the aggressors, they would prevent the US military from illegally occupying Syria and using gas and chemicals and napalm on civilians. I mean, if they can't stop the US from doing these things, you know, if they can't stop from illegally occupying Syria, then what power does the UN have? Where is the uh, uh, UN charter that's supposed to protect the sovereignty of nations? Nations can now arm militant groups in other nations' countries and invade them without so much as uh, any reprimand from the United Nations. Right. So why are we even looking towards the United Nations for humanity at all? Right. Uh, Dr. Robinson, before uh, we come to the end of the show, I do want to talk about the international community's role in terms of the refugees coming out of Syria. And do you think that they're doing enough on that front, uh, uh, trying to protect those people do, who are fleeing that conflict? Well, I'll, uh, in terms of the international response to the refugee situation, um, I, I, I have not looked closely at whether they're performing their job effectively or not. I think, uh, without wanting to sound like a broken record, we're back to the original point. If we're concerned about the refugees, we need to be concerned about what's driving and fueling the conflict. Okay, because if you stop that, then you stop the refugee flows. You're doing the most important thing you can do by ending the conflict. And one of the biggest problems that there's been, for example, in Britain and in America, is that publics have just been completely oblivious to the fact, in the case of the Syrian war, that it has been fueled uh, by Britain, America, and France, and um, and so populations are only thought that we just simply have civilians uh, who are fleeing as refugees, um, and that's all we can do is try to help them. Whereas in fact, what should be being done is that people should be pushing and pressing their governments to stop trying to overthrow the government. I, I know this sort of for some people this is a difficult, bitter pill to swallow. But this is the truth of what's been happening. If you look at all the figures, all of the evidence, and this isn't even disputed that this has been going on. If you want to help the refugees, if the international organizations need to be helped in, to do their job, you must first of all stop the people who are pouring arms in, who are trying to fuel the overthrow of, of the Syrian government. Then you'll be doing the, the biggest favor, the most important thing you possibly can for all the civilians who are refugees and civilians suffering within 
uh, the country. That's the most important thing you have to do. And we have to wake up to this. We really, this has been going on long enough now. We, we have to wake up to this. And how is that wake up call going to come? Because there is clearly uh, conflict fatigue on all, uh, all across the world. Now we keep talking about this. And as you said, it sounds like a broken record at this point, but how is the international community going to come to that point of pressurizing their governments? Well, I think there is growing awareness within the West. There are political actors who, who are significant political actors who are becoming increasingly aware of this. I think in the international system, I think China and Russia are pushing back. And on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Pierce Robinson, for joining us from Berlin. And thank you, Maram Sosli, for joining us from Perth. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.